Spirit and the Father and the soul of the Father and the Father of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and every one of the Spirit. The purpose of this particular scenario is to solve a uh, very simple partial differential equation model of human structure and human development. And uh, more specifically, we're going to have three goals for this scenario. Uh, the first thing I want to do is, uh, so far we've been building a lumped parameter model of uh, dynamic physics and human flows. And we've set the lumped parameter to a rotation differential constant. So we're going to find that number associated with every one of the three dynamics that we're trying to model. In this particular scenario, I'm going to explore very, very, I'm, on a very superficial level, the model that I did for the two differential models, which are basic terms, our, our distributed terms, which is again, uh, very often the manner of modeling the partial differential equation of some ordinary human physics situation. I'm not going to go through the theory of 2D modeling and stuff like that. It's just a kind of intellectual detail. The only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate 2D modeling and simplify things using a very simple piece of dynamic partial differential geometry and fluidity. The second goal is going to be to explore how we can take these 2D models and discretize them using uh, finite difference methods. The finite difference method is perhaps the most simplest and most extreme not necessarily the most efficient, but generally the simplest method that we have for discretizing the partial differential equation. But it, it does tend to be one of the first um, methods of thought for defining uh, or uh, for defining numerical solutions of partial differential equations because it is very simple. And then the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the discretized 2D model that we constructed, and uh, I'm going to show you how to code it up and develop it and how to scale it and develop it. In the process of doing so, I'm going to show you how to write a for loop in the model, uh, which is um, interesting because it gives us the ability to write uh, essentially vector uh, codices in any development using loops instead of having clusters in the name. So without further ado, we're going to actually go ahead and go over this and to explore the creation of 2D models of development uh, or 2D models of dynamic systems in general. The motivating problem that I'm going to explore here is going to be three conventions and a rod. So basically, I want you to take a uh, rod that's uniform in material throughout, um, much of which is duplicative of um, properties of this rod that are invariant with um, direction. Um, in other words, it doesn't really matter whether we're looking at the axial direction or the radial direction. Uh, whichever direction it is, um, the uh, conduction coefficient and other properties of the rod are the same. As a matter of fact, um, the way we have idealized the central rod here is essentially we say we only care about um, the, the axis of attraction of the rod. The rod has a common attraction that's invariant. Um, we're going to go ahead and do that. And I don't want to talk about this in great clarity. Um, we're going to assume that it has a rotator and a stereo with a density of rho and kilograms per meter cubed. And these specific heat capacities, it speaks to what the number specific heat capacity is always in joules per kilogram Kelvin. I don't want to use the actual numbers that they give us. Um, we are going to simplify this problem in an integer form, which is a very typical system that we've seen in the past. The introductory literature on solving uh, dynamics of PDE. We're going to assume that heat is expansive to the ends of the rod only, the two ends on the right hand side are not going to matter. In other words, there's no heat transfer between the rod and the other environment um, along the length of the rod. When, um, when heat is transferred um, along the length of the rod, it's only transferred within the rod, it's not transferred to the outside environment. So heat transfer between the rod and the outside environment takes place only through the ends of rho. Um, and we're going to assume that this rod, for simplicity, has the following boundary conditions. The left-hand side of the rod is inertial and heat limited as to constant temperature that we're going to refer to as Ei, let's say boiling water or something like that. And the right-hand side of the rod is inertial in another environment or another medium whose temperature is a constant low temperature that we're going to refer to as heat L. And what I would like to explore is the question of how to model and simulate the heat transfer in this rod over time, or the heat transfer through this rod over time. Now, we need to be careful here because 
very short, of course, uh, there will be a relatively simple solution to this and to the problem. Um, but that's a sort of quick solution. I want to explore a dynamic state and move into the field of system dynamics. I want to see the transient that's happening. And I take this rock, for example, and I put it at room temperature. And then suddenly I immerse it into the extreme media with a high and low temperature. What happens to the temperature inside the rock if it's in this transient process as um, the temperature of the extreme media fluid is able to um, allow it to be conducted to the outside world so it can perfectly clean the ceiling of the rock? That's the question I have to answer by also build models of physics, of the Dutch and Slavonic um, through this rock over time. So it's a dynamic class that I'm interested in. In order to build this dynamic class, I'm interested in what's called the basic law of free transfer. Uh, in particular, Fourier's uh, law of free convection. Okay. Now, for a simple linear um, medium undergoing a free convection, you can apply Fourier's law of free convection to uh, something like the, uh, the following manner. First of all, I'm going to pop up the rod in its light position, soft light position. And here's the rod sliding to the left. I'm going to draw an axis, an x-axis, along the length of the rod. And I'm going to say that at the left end of this rod, the temperature, capital T, is a function of location x and time t. Now, please forgive me for this uh, slight um, change in perspective in the vision here. So far, we've been using x and t as our coordinate together. But now, here x is our um, position along the length of the rod. Time is still t. And um, our state variable is going to actually end up being a capital T of, uh, as a function of x and t, as a function of distance and time. And you notice how, because we have an infinite number of locations along the rod, we already have an infinite number of state variables. And this slice of rod that I've popped up, I'm going to make its thickness or width delta x. And so at the other end of that slice, the temperature is just a little different. Um, it is not equal to T of X and T of T. It is the T of X and T plus a small change. And um, essentially using a truncation of the state of zero convention, that small change is equal to the slope of the temperature um, profile with respect to distance, partial T by partial X, multiplied by the thickness delta X, and that's, of course, an approximation. So with this in mind, uh, Fourier's law of heat conduction says that the heat conducted through the left face of the rod is basically equal to a conductivity coefficient, kappa or k in this case, times the cross-sectional area of the rod A, multiplied by the temperature gradient, partial T by partial X. And uh, remember, heat transfer, conduction heat transfer, or heat transfer in general, occurs opposite to a temperature gradient. It happens from high temperature to low temperature, hence the negative sign. So the heat flux, or heat flow rate, I I call that on the left side of the rod is equal to negative K gradient partial T by partial X. On the right hand side of the rod, the equation gets a little more complicated because partial T by partial X grows or changes. Um, the heat out of the right face of the rod is still negative K times A multiplied by not just partial T by partial X, but the change in partial T by partial X also which is approximated using the state of zero distribution as partial squared t by partial x squared times delta x. So those are the heat flow rates into and out of the right and left face of, of this top or this slice of the rod. Now I want to apply the first law of thermal dynamics. The first law of thermal dynamics says that heat flowing into this slice of the rod minus heat flowing out is equal to the rate of change of internal energy stored in the slice of the rod. So heat in is negative KADT by dx, or partial T by partial x. Heat out is minus, but I need to subtract that so that I end up with a plus KA times partial T by partial x, which is partial squared T by partial x squared delta x. And that whole expression on the left-hand side of the equation has to equal the rate of change with respect to time of the heat stored inside this slice of the rod. Now, the heat stored inside this slice of the rod is equal to the mass of the slice, density, times area, times thickness, multiplied by specific heat capacity, multiplied by temperature. So we end up with this equation here representing the first law of thermodynamics. 
The first thing we notice, of course, is that KA partial B by partial F, it is repeated twice on the left-hand side of the equation with positive and negative signs, so these cancel. Once we cancel them, we notice that the entire equation is multiplied by delta X. So for a sufficiently small delta X, we can simplify and remove delta X. And what we end up with is that KA partial squared C by partial F squared gives you rho A C T partial C with respect to time. And then finally, we can cancel the two areas and ended up with K times partial squared C by partial F squared is equal to rho C T times the partial derivative of entropy with these particles. This is the governing heat transfer, the governing partial differential equation for heat transfer in the water. So we derive the governing PDD for heat transfer in the water. So that completes essentially the first goal of this tutorial, which is to explore the creation of PDDs representing simple heat transfer problems. And the second thing I want to do is I want to explore how to discretize these PDDs using one of the simplest distribution methods out there, the finite difference method, and ultimately the goal being to simulate this heat transfer problem in Nivellum. So in order to uh, discretize using finite difference, I want to recall the motivating problem here, which is that I have a rod, one end of it is immersed in a high temperature medium and the other end is immersed in a low temperature medium. And so I'm going to begin discretization by declaring that the leftmost location of this rod corresponds to x is equal to 0. The rightmost location corresponds to x is equal to L, the length of the rod. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, chop up this rod into finite pieces. Now we're not doing infinitesimal derivations anymore. We're not doing trying to derive the PDDs. We're trying to discretize the PDDs. And so now we're going to slice up the rod into finite length slices. And essentially we're going to put nodes on the rod at finite spaced locations. The first location is going to be the leftmost location. And I'm going to give that an index i is equal to 0. And then after that, there's another location with an index i is equal to 1, index i is equal to 2. The very last location has an index i is equal to n, where n is the number sequentially of slices that I want to slice the rod into. And as a result, if I use a uniform heat distribution, uniform finite difference distribution of this rod, what I'm saying is that the width of each slice is equal to the whole length of the rod L divided by the number of slices N. Okay. Now, with this in mind, it's very easy to see that the bounding condition translates into that the temperature at index 0 is always equal to T high, and the temperature at index N is always equal to T low. These are not differential equations. These are algebraic equations corresponding to the bounding condition. So T0 and Tn are not actually going to be state variables in my state space map. However, when I look at the PDE, it applies everywhere else other than the map state. The PDE says that K times partial squared C by partial F squared is rho CT times partial C by partial time. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discretize this PDE. I'm going to apply this PDE at every index i from 1 all the way to n minus 1. So what I end up with is rho ct times t1 dot is equal to the partial derivative of t with respect to x squared times k evaluated at i is equal to 1. And the same happens at i is equal to 2, i is equal to 3, and so on. In other words, for every value of i between 1 and n minus 1, rho ct ti dot, where ti is now a state variable, is equal to k time. The simplest approximation I can do of the second uh, derivative, one of the simplest approximations I can do of the second derivative, is the finite difference approximation. I'm going to use central difference for this approximation. And so I'm going to get the temperature T at i plus 1 minus 2 times the temperature T at point i plus the temperature T at point i minus 1 divided by the discretization length squared, which is L over n plus 0. Okay. Now remember, we're using finite differences here. Finite differences are among the simplest ways to discretize PDEs. There are more sophisticated ways to discretize PDEs, but I just 
I want to give you an introduction to the use of these elements for solving very, very simple problems in the integration class in C++. Now, what's interesting here is that our state variables in this disparate activity model are p1 through all the way to pn minus 1. So we've succeeded in simplifying this model group to the distributed parameter model, which is an infinite number of W uh, differential equations for an infinite number of state variables. So we have succeeded in simplifying this into an ordinary differential equation model, um, essentially a state space model with a finite number of state variables. So that's an approximation. The state variables are P1 through Pn minus 1, and what I've outlined in red here, that's our difference of integration class, okay? Now, with this, we have finished the two first goals of the tutorial, which are to explore the creation of PDE models for a simple heat conduction problem, and number two, to explore the distributization of these models in the Nakano system. What is left here is to solve this PDE model using Angelica, and I want to show you how to do that um, mostly because I want to show you how to incorporate for loops into Modelica because they happen to be very, very convenient. So with that in mind, let's move on to the Modelica uh, connection editor, OM edit. And what I've done is I've created a model for you called the conduction PDE example one. And the code for this model is very simple. You've seen a lot of this before. The parameter values in this model are made up and I strongly encourage you to take this model and actually insert real parameter values for real materials into this model and see how the results change if you were to build a rod out of steel or out of aluminum or out of copper or glass, um, how the speed at which the rod's temperature, or the, the speed with which the rod's temperature reacts to external stimuli, um, how that changes if depending on how conductive the material is. It's, it's a very interesting exercise, and uh, the results of, of this exercise are pretty intuitive. Um, so um, the parameters for this model are the density of the material, the specific heat capacity of the material, the length of the rod, the conductivity of the material, um, the uh, low temperature and the high temperature that I've immersed the end of the rod in. Those I've chosen to correspond to ice boiling water just for the fun of it. Um, I want to give this rod an initial temperature. I've given it an initial temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. So what I'm saying here is that the rod is initially at a temperature that is somewhat of an elevated room temperature. So think of the rod being in a fairly warm room. And then suddenly I've immersed it into an environment where one end is in ice and the other end is in boiling water. Um, I can choose different levels of distribution of this model, essentially different numbers of nodes for my finite difference class. Um, I pick n is equal to 10 here, so essentially I've been slicing up the rod into 10 slices. If I want a more accurate distribution, I can make n bigger. If I want a less accurate distribution, um, I can make n smaller. Uh, you can't make it too small, of course, because then uh, you wouldn't even be able to implement the PDE. You notice that P0 and P n is a given, and the PDE is only applied to P1 through Pn minus 1. So um, n had better be 2 or more if you even want to be able to implement um, a distributation of the PDE. And of course, for the sake of accuracy, you want to make n larger and larger and larger. The price you pay is that the larger the number of distributions, the more computationally expensive this model is going to be. Now, my state variables are only p1 through pn minus 1. So I'm going to declare a vector of state variables. It's a real vector of state, but it only has n minus 1 entries. And my um, distributation length is actually the length of the rod L divided by n. You'll notice some new sections in this model that you haven't seen in Modelica models before, and that's for which is the initial equation section. The initial equation section allows us to initialize the state variables that we want. And so what I'm doing here is I'm going to uh, the index i equaling 1 to n minus 1, and I'm setting pi equal to p init only initially. The initial equation section only applies at the first moment of simulating the model. And then we go to the equation section. 
essentially we take a file and implement it anywhere in the browser. In data case, we use the right hand side of the web browser, Chrome, stick to and CI DOM because all we did was pair times CI plus one minus two CI minus uh, plus CI minus one divided by hello brand zero. You'll notice that I've written this equation separately for the first node and last node. So it should be just for i is equal to one and i is equal to n minus one. And then I have a loop that applies this differential equation, this state equation, for i equal to 2 through n minus 3. And here's the reason I've done that. Um, when I apply this um, set of state equations to t1, I need to use the value of t0 in my equation. But t0 is the same as t i, and so I need to change the actual coding of the equation a little bit. So I do that separately. Similarly, when I apply this um, state equation to t n minus 1, I need to apply it to t n. I need to invoke t n in my state equation. But t n is the same as t low, and so I need to write that separately. And so I do. Okay? I could have written this code in several different ways, some of which are more elegant than others. But the point is this. I've written a loop um, or set of code that allows me to say that Regardless of the value of n, whether it's 10, 20, 30, or 50, my equation, my governing equation, will stay const for the PDB for every state, every district I create. So row stick to ci dom is equal to k times ci plus 1 minus 2 ci plus ci minus 1 divided by that governing equation. Now what I want to do is I want to simulate this model. I'm going to simulate it for one second, and I want to see what I get. Okay. So here's what happens. If you look at the simulation results, I want to show t high and t low versus i. And of course, there are always 0 and 100 degrees. But in between, I want to show t1, t2, t3, all the way to t9 also. And here's what you notice. Um, eventually, after some time, uh, the distribution of temperature along the length of the rod becomes linear. The edge of the rod that surpassed to the 100 degree detour is at 100 degrees. The edge of the rod that surpassed to the 0 degree detour is at 0 degrees. And the points that are in the middle are at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, all the way to 90 degrees. And that makes sense. But there is a huge transfer transient that takes place where some of the points are warming up very quickly from 30 degrees Celsius, the initial conditions, all the way up to 90 or 80 or 70 degrees. Some of the points are cooling down uh, from the initial temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, they overshoot, they overcool a little bit, and then they come back up, uh, and uh, they, uh, they reach a temperature of 10, 20, uh, in one case, they come back to 30 degrees Celsius. Okay? And that behavior seems to be intuitive behavior. But one question I want to ask you, and I want to leave that as a question for thought, is how much faith do we have in the correctness of this simulation? And the question I really want to ask you is this. When we discretize this model um, as uh, using a finite difference matrix by chopping it up and slicing it up along the length of the rod into 10 slices, do we really have enough slices to get an accurate representation of the dynamic potential in this rod? Do we really trust the tensor, the graph that we have in front of us? What if we use fewer discretizations or more discretizations in space? How does the number of discretizations check accurately? I can ask a similar question about the solvers that we're using in the time domain. How does the, the solver check the accuracy of the time domain dynamic? As a matter of fact, how does our simple finite difference matrix affect the accuracy of our dynamic? These are all questions you should think about. Uh, I will leave them for you as pieces of food for thought. Um, I strongly encourage you to play with this numerical code, fiddle with it, um, see what you can do to make it run more accurately, perhaps faster, see what the trade-offs between simulation speed and accuracy are. Um, but at this point, we're done with the goals of this particular goal namely building a PDB model of a substantial problem, very simple substantial problem, seeing how we can discretize it using finite differences, 
and then see how we can implement those lessons as typical clinical things are. Thank you very much for uh, listening, and I look forward to the next four weeks.